uh, there's an happy occasion on the birth anniversary of uh, Mr. R.K. Sami hosting this uh, event. We've got two outstanding speakers, a speaker couple, I can say that, who are going to be really enthrall you with some phenomenal ideas, phenomenal concept of some of the subject, very rarely discussed. And uh, the speaker will be very in detail introduced by Mr. Swami. We have with us Dr. D.K. Hari and Dr. D.K. Mrs. Hari will be there, the founder trustee of Bharat Gyan. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of uh, applause to the different speakers. They will be talking to us today on our heritage, our pride. Now, may I request uh, the distinguished speakers, uh, Hari, Mrs. Hari, and Mr. Mahalingam, Mr. Srinivasan Swami, and Mr. Balaswamy, please take the place on the dais. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause to our distinguished Then uh, the fifth R.K. Swami Memorial Lecture will be delivered by Dr. Hari and Hema Hari. Then as usual, if you have any questions, uh, the number which is flashed on the screen, please send your question to the number. All the questions will be put uh, placed before the speakers to answer them. People who are here, uh, we'll pass you the slips that if you say, no, 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 we wanted to speak to Mike, we'll give it to you. Uh, we only request you to only address the questions uh, because the heritage lecture will be delivered only by the speaker. Now it's my proud privilege to request Mr. Srinivasan K. Swami to offer the introductory remarks. It's also my equal privilege to say a few words about the introduction. Uh, Srinivasan Swami, the Chairman and Managing Director of the RK Swami Limited, overseeing diverse ventures in advertising, market research, analytics and real estate. Uh, serving various social causes, uh, he's the President of Hindu Mission Hospital, Chairman of Valdur uh, Kottam and uh, Valdur Gurukalam Society, showcasing his commitment to both industry and community service. He is also the past president of MMA and IMA. I request Mr. Swami to deliver the introductory remarks and also introduce the speaker. President Mali, President Balasabhumunyam, past presidents MMA, past presidents Retouching Club, executive members of MMA and uh, that club, my good friends, Hema and uh, Hari, friends. <clears throat> Let me add my own welcome to the Ramali. We already have been very warm in his welcome. Uh, I want to add my own welcome to his kind words for the fifth Arkeso Memorial Lecture. I also want to thank him for all the kind words he showered on us. So thank you very much for all those kind words. It sometimes gets embarrassing if you are Shankar walking in. <laughs> I just, I think it's been a fi fine journey the last five years. The fifth memorial lecture is a culmination of four different subjects we undertook, each different. And I would say each eclectic in nature. We started out with D. Sivakumar, where he talked about the future of consumer engagement. Then we moved on to Seshai, where he talked about values for the 21st century. It's again very, very different, but very required to be remembering what kind of values that we should actually embrace in the new era. And he talked about how Social media was influencing a lot and all that. Then we moved on to S. Gurumuthi. He talked about emerging global civilizational paradigm in India. Again, very similar to what Hari would say, be what he said, but, but, but Gurumuthi was talking about more future. I'm assuming Hari will talk more about the past. And of course, we had the former finance minister, Pandemir Tagarajan, last year, talking about. Uh, shaping Tamil Nadu towards a trillion dollar state. So this year, as I said, we have this wonderful sort of speakers, uh, Hema and uh, Hari, and they're going to talk about our heritage, our pride. This is the kind of subject that is very, very close to my father's heart. As Ms. Malingam said, you, you actually nailed it very well. It's something that my father believed in our, and the treasured our heritage, he felt that, uh, you know, he was one of those human beings who can actually quote from the Puranas, 
quote from various uh, scriptures and connect to the task at hand. That's the kind of person that he was. And I'm sure, you know, some of those nuggets of information that Hari and Hema will share will also be uh, the same zone. I know this couple for a long time. Uh, I know when, you, when they got married. And, uh, and I know that, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, I've been part of their family for several decades. And it so happens that uh, uh, my father knew them also very well. So, and he wanted to talk about a subject of communication in the Ashtad era. And I said, no, let's not get there. I think let's not talk about communication because he said there are lots to talk about. I said, maybe there are lots to talk about, but I'd rather focus on our heritage, our culture, than talk about communication in a different era. <clears throat> Uh, having said that, I think uh, Hema and uh, Hari gave up their lucrative job some 25 years ago, started Bharat Gyan, an NGO, a trust, and they devoted they devote a certain amount of their time in doing work that actually dig deep, digs deep into the Indic civilization of this country. They actually are amazing in the quality of research and the depths they go to in unearthing the facts and connecting the dots in a manner that is going to be very difficult for normal persons to deal with. You will talk about the root words on some of the aspects and talk about why those root words are going to lead to this kind of expression and how this is actually connecting with the rest of the stuff. So the amazing kind of a you know, a couple that I've seen and I'm sure that they will make us all more learned about uh, our past because our past if you celebrate it will be something that that will help us understand the future better uh, today our history books do not show our history that we can be proud of. There is, there is subjects of this kind that we need to be talking about in other fora so that we do know there is another dimension of history which is what makes us all very proud. And so that way I think Hema and Hari are very, very, uh, you know, relevant. And we should have more of these people in this country to make a big difference. As I said, I know that this the same couple at least for 30 years. Uh, I think we got to know each other mid 80s to start with, and then then I, they got married later that that, that the decade 28, 88, 89, something, something like that. So I think yes, and we were uh, in touch with that family. Uh, this is uh, this is something that they got into without hesitation, without actually talking about can I afford to give up my lucrative job? Am I wasting my time? There's so much of pressure, family pressure on them to say don't do this because this is not going to give you, this is not going to put bread on the table. It's not going to put your, you know, it's not easy for you to make a name for yourself. But they motor along and they did very well. They are part of Art of Living for almost a decade. And uh, they, they have written actually more than 100 books. They have written more than 100 blogs. They have actually got 500 hours of uh, multi, uh, what is it, multi, whatever, uh, that, uh, the AVs that they have. So, <clears throat> and I have not come across such prolific writers and people who are going to be, uh, you know, connecting the dots as it were all the time for us. So I give you Hema and Hari. So thank you very much for being here. Very good for you. Thank you. Thank you, Sundar. First of all, for inviting us, and then uh, this wonderful introduction that you gave. It's, it's a very personal 
introduction you gave about us and uh, thank you to MMA and uh, Group Captain Vijay Kumar for inviting us to be part of this and so many known faces, friends through the decades and so many new friends that we'll be making this evening. Wonderful to be here. Uh, out of the earlier four uh, innovative lectures of Shakya Shami, three we have certainly attended. So we have been very much part of the family and uh, as he said, uh, the first time I met Shri R.K. Swami was probably in 1982. Uh, so since then, uh, been knowing all the members of the family so well and it's, it's, it's certainly an honor for us to be speaking at the memorial lecture. Thank you so much. And as he said about uh, the idea of Bharat Gyan, see the, the, we came up, he said, with a lot of uh, hurdles we had to get through to doing what we are doing because we liked it. That's one. And as all of us have been traveling, we have also been traveling a lot. And what we found was wherever we went, in each place they showcased what they have well. But we unfortunately have not been showcasing, not now, I'm talking about in the 90s, the pre-Google era. There was, no, there was hardly any showcasing of this land. So the point was we asked, what is there to speak about India? What is there about our civilization? Can we speak about it in a logical, rational, scientific way to the youngsters? In a way they will understand, in their lingo. So that's what we sort of got into it. We, we, we left our careers at the peak to get into understanding the knowledge of our civilization. And when he said uh, the subject being our heritage, our pride, thought it will be apt for it. And when you say heritage, all of us normally think about heritage as only uh, certain... Uh, buildings, monuments, temples and all that. That's what you think of. Chennai, as you said, has gone through a tremendous flood. So, the lakes and water bodies of Chennai too are our heritage. If we had looked after our heritage, we would not have been in the mess that we were have been. Because we have about 4,000 plus water bodies enumerated in and around Greater Chennai. If we had known how to sort of keep them in good repair, as mentioned by Major Sanke 170 years back, in good repair and well connected, we would not have been in this mess. So, understanding heritage is not just of the past, but of immediate use as of last week also. And so, for the coming week also, when we have one more, probably one more boat of rains, one more cyclone. So, it's very important. That's inheritance. It's not just the jewelry or the land documents inheritance. Every aspect of this is our inheritance actually. So that's our heritage and that's really our pride. That's what the fact it is. And uh, getting on to the man, Sri R.K. Swami, when, he's, when he told us about this, one thing has always occurred to me. He was more than his measure, a tall stature man, knowledgeable, but he was also, we felt that. And uh, when we traveled different parts, we found one thing. In Jaipur, if you go, you'll, you'll get the Savai Mansingh st uh, Stadium. And uh, one of the nine gems of Akbar was also Savai Mansingh. Uh, so what does the word Savai there mean? It means one and a quarter. So something more than a person. He was more than a man. Certainly it was. Similarly, if you go to Turkey, uh, if you look at uh, Atatürk, Mustafa Kemal Pasha, the word Atatürk means two and a quarter, two and a half. Adai, we say as in Hindi. So he is more than a man. He is more than a man. Similarly, Sri R.K. Swami was also certainly more than the measure that he was in many ways. Knowledge, stature, accomplishment. So we thought that should be the first slide to say that he certainly belongs to that league. <laughs> Thank you that all of you sort of think so really nice and that we knew this man was even more happening personally. And uh, we found this beautiful quote from the book uh, R.K. Swami, His Life and Times. To justify and this point. To justify this point and I'll just read out this bit for those who can't perhaps uh, read it from far. In 1982 when David Ogilvy visited Madras, I requested Swami, I is Mr. Mani Ayer. I requested Swami to host the dinner. Swami readily obliged. After interacting with Swami for, a time, for some time, the following conversation ensued between me and David. Mani, tell me seriously, is this man in advertising? I said, yes. Really? Or is it a hobby? Asked David Ogilvy. I said, no, he is a very serious practitioner. Why do you ask? David said, well, quite frankly, what a waste of talent in advertising. So, so look at the man that he is. Wealth of talent. So, and which we, uh, we were very happy, you know, with this backdrop 
uh, it's very nice to see him sitting there and we here, uh, you know, almost as, at his feet because we have had a uh, number of occasions where we interacted with him and we could hear, uh, you know, pearls of wisdom from him. We have been inspired actually very early days of Bharat Gyan, even before we started Bharat Gyan, we've been inspired by a lot of interactions with uh, Sri R.K. Swami. And we have discussed this idea with him also then. Okay, go next point. So this talk on our heritage and our pride, uh, we dedicated it. We dedicated to his memory, and especially to honor the skills of speech, script, signages, and spirituality that he exemplified. That's the key point. And see, uh, we want to see he is. He started his life as a corporate early stage in, in South Gujarat, I guess. So, so he was discerning like the Hansa, his symbol. Like that we saw, the uh, two other ins instances we can see here, the early scribe, Lord Ganesha, he scribed, his missing was, only when I understand it, I'll scribe. So Ganesha exemplified knowledge and understanding. So he didn't write just because sage Veda Vyasa Krishna Dwaipena dictated something to him. He wrote it after understanding it. So they, he, he put that clause. Only I'll write scribe only after understanding. So similarly, if you look at the Egyptian scribes, the famous Egyptian scribes. So you have Thoth, who is the official Egyptian scribe, and uh, he is actually symbolized as an ibis, which is a bird that signifies balance and, uh, you know, being very right, impartial when they write. So like that, we've had people who represent certain aspects and... Uh, We've had uh, Sri R.K. Swami as well, who has been lovely quotes that you can find in that book of uh, on him. So coming from that aspect, if you look at it, so talking about these early scribes, how do we know about our heritage, our past? So we get to know from what they have left behind. But very sadly, some of the things that we see are things we haven't been able to understand so far. But luckily now there have been some breakthroughs and uh, these are some of these signs like these circles and crosses and lines. But these you find going way back to more than 5000 years. And these are some messages that they have left behind for us. Look at this, this one of the world's Alice. oldest sign board. Well over 5,000 years ago. This is in a place called Dolavira. So, so that's the excavation site where you have the sign board at the top and the way it's been sort of remarked here for, for us in the slab below. So look at this. So we talk about, you talk about signages today. Can you think of 5,000 year old signage in a language that we can understand? Let's look at that now. So the messaging. And these kind of signs, how far do you find? You find them all the way from, you won't believe, Tahiti to Phoenicia. This entire stretch you find these kind of signs. And interestingly, you will find that these are places where you also find a lot of influence about, of influence of the Paratiya civilization. And if you so, still won't believe about one Tahiti... Second. No, one second. Because many people think Indian civilization to be, to be very limited geographically. But here we are going to show you real live examples. The spread of it from Tahiti, which is in Polynesia, Micronesia, Easter Islands, all the way up to the Mediterranean. Amazing. From the Pacific Ocean to that. Not now, 4,000 years ago, they had the same signage systems across. Look at the spread of... The civilization, spread of knowledge, spread of communication. And how did they communicate? Today we, we find it difficult to communicate across two states. Here these people are communicating across continents, across ages. Look at that. And so, here is the Tahiti script and the Harappan script. Look how similar they are. We'll show you the more details. And uh, this was called the Rongo Rongo tablet. In Tahiti. Here you will find it even more. So this person, Hevsev, he points out 90 similarities. Look at this. This is the Rongo Rongo Easter Island script and this is the Indus Valley script. Look at each one of them. We have tabulated it for our research purpose which we are sharing here. This slow, is slow, slow, carved slow, slow, on wood. Slow, slow, this slow, is slow. on clay. Look at that. Across the seven seas, Saat Samandar Par, identical 5000 years ago. So look at the messaging that goes. One on clay tablet, one on wood. So, so that's one you can see that. So or we showed you one end, now we'll show you the other end in Phoenicia. Look at this. 
Finish. So what is Phoenicia famous for? What do people recognize Phoenicia for? Of course, today you don't have Phoenicia as one nation or one civilization. Uh, you find it spread across many of the East Mediterranean uh, countries. countries. But Phoenicia is supposed to have been the source for the Western alphabets, which is why you see Phoenicia, phoneme, phonetics, phone, and have you ever thought all this comes from the word from the Phoenician civilization? And, and that is the basis of communication for whole of Europe. It was a precursor for Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Latin and then English. Because today if you look at it, the English alphabets, they are traced to the Phoenician alphabets. Now, if you look at the English alphabets, the Roman alphabets, you have A, B, C, D, E, this is the order. Arabic, you have Aleph, Be, Gim, Greek, you have this order. One second. But you do not have a very solid explanation for the sequence. Why, Why does should... B come after A? Sure. So, we sort of compete with each other. <laughs> See, the point is, look at the beauty of it. Do you have any scientific expression as to why should B come after A? Or why should uh, C come before D? Be it in any of the languages? None. We don't have any explanation as to sequencing. So, then it's not scientific because you can you can start the alphabet with the L, M, and Q, Z, K, B, C. You can do. It's right. You're right. There's there's no need of so there's no logic. Whereas, look at our Indian language. All Indian language, be it Punjabi to Sharada script to Assamese to the one in Nagaland to Sinhala to Tamil to Baluchi, all of them. So you have the vowels. And you have the consonants and Tamil, we beautifully call them Uyir Eritu, Meir And uh, there's a very deep uh, meaning to why we have named them such as well. And you will find actually Tamil, they write it like this, all the uh, alphabets. But then if you put it down like this, you see a beautiful similarity between both of them. And we have organized them as series of Ka, Ch, T, T and so on. Why did we do it like this? Why is the question. While we don't have a why, we can't even ask a question why there, nor will we get an answer. Here we can ask a question why and also get an answer. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty. That's the science, the logic, the rational in communication. And we are going to see just that. When, when people say it's one of the most perfect scripts, but why is it the most perfect script? Have we asked ourselves that question? See, so many people will say this or that, but why do we have a logical answer? So, vowels, uh, they are the life givers, the uirith, because they are just sound that come out unobstructed. A, e, u, and all, they just unobstructed by any of the contours of your mouth. And then you look at this. If you want to say ka, then you have to modulate it with the parts of your mouth. Your buccal cavity has to modulate it and you get the ka out. Then you have the when it touches the palate, upper palate, you have the cha. You try saying all these, as you talk, you will realize where your tongue has to touch. So, you find that our ancestors had actually understood the anatomy of the buccal cavity. Which are the parts, when does a sound come, when, what part touches which other aspect of the mouth. Danta, teeth, dental. Look at the Indian word danta, to the dantam of elephant, to dental, to dentistry. Same root. So, see how this, ta, bringing the lips together. So, so, you see that, so you cannot change the sequence of alphabet in Indian civilization languages. There is a logic, there is a rush, you can't change it, and of course it's all biological, it all de goes de deal with your oral cavity. It's scientific. So, that is the fundamental aspect of communication that we see here. And this now, uh, there are people who have actually tried to trace the source and falling back on... Of the Phoenician alphabets, of the Phoenician sequence. And comparing it with the Indian alphabets, they are now able to conclude that it was the Indian alphabets which have travelled to Phoenicia. And during this, a couple of swaps have happened, which therefore have yielded the order of ABCD that you see today. So that is something and you will find that in this paper by a person called Wim Bors Boone and uh, he has written extensively that while copying there were two errors of historic proportion, that's what he says. So uh, 
so far people have been saying the definition alphabets are from the egyptian hieroglyphs alone but if you see that uh, this particular thing actually talks about the sequence and they are able to justify and explain how the sequence has got changed now is that the only reason i mean can we just say just because of this that uh, you know the alphabets and the science of sound has traveled from india to the west look at it there is yet another beautiful example which is the saptaswara the notating see music is very natural everybody can sing everybody can make melodious sounds the thing is the, the science comes when you want to translate that sound into a written form into a form that you can read and then recall or produce reproduce the kind of melody that was originally produced so that is when you need the notations and then you need to represent those melodious notes so you need to figure out how in your anatomy can you reproduce those notes and if you look at it this notating swaras again uh, all of you would know that uh, in india we talk about uh, sari gama padani right and you would also be familiar with do re mi the seven notes and they are very similar in uh, our indian we would say sa ri ga ma pa da ni the same thing in do re mi do re mi fa so la ti so they very similar so why is this similarity there and, and seven in both why so similar who got it from where who has got the answer who is who has got the logical scientific reason because that decides the methodology of communication again so interestingly in india we are able to explain if you go back to our uh, ancient text you will find the very clear explanation for these notes so we say sa that is shadjam now the beauty that we have done i mean this is mastery what they have done here is see on one side so you didn't need the notes to actually sing you can sing without the notes you can all we can all make music but there are some notes which are pleasant to hear now when you come to those pleasant notes what did our ancestors do they figured out what where is it coming from originate where is it originating from where i mean originate meaning where is it resonating inside your body so if you look at it sa when you try and then they picked up animals who sounds if you imitate you will create the same resonance it's not that the animal if you hear a peacock i think today everybody they get disappointed you know people who come from abroad to see the peacock they look at it for the beauty and they expect it to have a beautiful voice but you know they listen to the voice oh my god is that a peacock but the sound of a peacock may not sound like sir but the resonance it creates is what is the same as when you sing a sir so try you you do that i mean i'm i'm going to show you small examples and you can try that yourself too so try singing sa it will come all the way you have to get the sound out from your navel nabi nabi and why do you equate that with a peacock what is the sound of a peacock try uh, thinking of the sound of a peacock it will do you have to get that sound out from your navel all the way from your navel because it has this long neck then look at the bull rishabham as we call it how does a bull make a sound ma ma so this sound resonates here at the chest similarly you try the different animals the goat gandharam me me the sound is from here so these animals as you imitate they all lead you to the different points of vibration and the resonance points of resonance and that's how they are beautifully named while rishabham gandharam they are all similar to the animals why is shadjam for a peacock why is it naming so because it's a mayur or mayil why did they call it shadjam even there you can see the subtlety the you science the science and the subtle understanding so this sound when it comes all the way from the navel it has to transcend your chest your throat the base of your tongue your nose your teeth and lips so six nodes it passes through it, it it's it's born six times over 
J means birth. Sh they meaning six. So it's six times born. So because it passes through six aspects of your alimentary canal system. So it is six resonating points. So shut jam, therefore six times born sound. So that is how so this what does this tell us? It tells us that we have understood this so well. We have understood the logic of sound, music, script, everything, the, or the whole vocal cord system, we understood so scientifically, uniquely. And in the Western, you have the same seven notes as Do, Re, Mi, Fa. So how did these come about? Now that is very interesting. So while we are able to show with logic and science as to how these notes are coming up, in the Western, if you see, if you ask them, how did Do, Re, Mi come about? What you will find is they will trace it to a hymn of St. John. And here it is, this is the hymn. I won't read the Latin because, uh, I mean, I'll straight away go to the English. So with all the voice can be sung, your wonderful feats by your servants to wipe clean their tainted lips, O St. John. So they took yut, re, mi, fa, so, la, Sancti Jonas, so Saint and John. So, in, and over time, this youth became Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, C, S, I became T. So, this is how they are able to trace. And in our book, we have written in detail how this holds good even for the Japanese. The Japanese have got an Iroha system. Even there, they trace it to the starting letters of their. I'll, uh, I mean, certain the, hymns. The old hymn. Now, the point is, if you go in Western classical music, it stops here. Beyond this, you, you don't have anything to go. Any explanation? It, it's got a glass ceiling, uh, not solid concrete ceiling. If you go to Japanese Eastern side, you have a solid ceiling there. You can't go beyond that. Whereas in Indian thought, it goes all the way up to nature, prakriti, yerkai. And that's where you don't have a ceiling, at all, either glass or concrete, nothing. You go right through. So, you're directly into So, that is what we understood this aspect. That's why we could sort of traverse over 4,000 years across continents, across seas and communicate. And therefore, look at it. The word for speech itself is Bharati. Bharati, one of the meanings. I mean, we actually have a... It's beautiful how we have named our land Bharat. Many, many meanings. And one of them is also Bharati, which means speech. And look at what we have therefore done. We have decided, yes, we won't stop with speech, but we will see how to communicate without speaking and how to also preserve the speech. So we have gone into the mode of writing. It is actually a myth that uh, in India, every uh, knowledge, everything that was uh, uh, knowledge or sciences... Was given, or was only oral. oral. That's a myth. We yeah. had writing right from the very beginning. Aksharam. Sharam is to dissolve. Aksharam, not dissolve. They look at the term itself. And so for writing, what do you therefore do? This continuous speech, how do you break it down into units that can be written down? So that is what becomes your alphabet, your phoneme, your syllable. And that thus was born your A, A, E, E, your vowels, and then your uh, gaga and everything and then the various rules of how these sounds combine. So this has been our uh, prowess and it's because of this understanding that we have been able to surmount the challenges of uh, going across ages, age groups, civilizations, geographies, languages and scripts. But the question now will come Okay, you've said all this, but how did they really still communicate between Tahiti up to Phoenicia? That's the question. Look at this. Today, even when we go with all the translators that we have, if you go to uh, say Japan or Tahiti or uh, some other country or Turkey or uh, Azerbaijan, we'll be tongue-tied to talk to them. Isn't it? With all the things that we have with us. Think of this. 4,000 years back, our traders went and traded there, communicated. Can you imagine? Neither did they know where the land was, did they know the language, nor the people, but still they successfully went. Okay, we should look at that perspective, how did they do it? Both the sounds and the scripts. Where, where they did not know where people existed or where the land existed. That's the beauty of what they did. So that's all in the mind. That's that is when you, you find that 
the trade and the symbols and signages so those dholavira signs that we saw they were fundamentally used for by the trading community for trade so we had definite aksharams in which we wrote our literature and we also had symbols and signs so aksharam were, was for people who knew that particular language who spoke that particular language who could write that particular script and so for them within the internal we could use the aksharam but when you had to transcend boundaries you started using symbols and signs and these are today one of the last uh, scripts to be deciphered and there have been some marvelous breakthroughs especially uh, it's been found that it can be uh, deciphered using a rebus technique that is where you use words and the symbols for uh, uh, explaining what the words for example i mean we're just using two very simple examples just look two sa two samples we're going to use so this for is of time just use two look at this this is one of the seals and there is this one particular symbol here one small figure if you put it down it looks like this this is very similar to a squirrel and what does the squirrel denote fundamentally so what they would use is they would use the word a squirrel in a language i mean and, and there is a beauty that's also been discovered is that there have been because of the trade there have been words that have become popular across all these lands see it's very easy i can go to a new land show my product and say bottle 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 so after a few days they understand this is bottle so like that they have picked up some of the words and one was for shreni and who is a shreni a trader he is an aggregator in in indian Ooh. context trade is aggregation aggregation of produce from various small scale units all over the land we have been a decentralized uh, land civilization this is production units using aggregators so the concept of this was commerce is aggregation so to represent a trader you showed a squirrel and if you wanted to show a sword which was one of the most commonly and uh, very sought after item that we traded we look at some of them now the the sword uh, was denoted by these slashes because what did these slashes uh, represent they represented cuts and you know the the word is khanda khanda is khandagar khand sundara kandam kumari kandam look at that idea of these are sections sections and kandam portions kanda tundam even in tamil tamil you have got the word kandam tundama vetuve look at that so the idea of all the so portions bharata kandam look at the, everywhere you have this idea and what do you call a thing that comes out of cut sugar cake you get the word candy the english word candy comes from it the idea so khand so portion sections a cut aspect so that's how you communicated across lands look at the way the ingenuity they used ingeniousness absolutely in the field of communication is amazing so it is organic natural nature based and that's what helped us transcend time geographies and civilizations but if you notice i mean we do have our emojis today but like their name emoji emoticon they are fundamentally still at the level of many of them with emotions and we need to transcend for various abstract aspects and here is where our heritage we are really at a great advantage because of our heritage for we have dealt with all these various aspects of just pure sound our om our concept of om uh, is is the ultimate in the understanding of the science of sound it's ultimate the keyword and uh, then for mudra which are hand signs we have had the karana for abhinaya the face signs we have had the rasa navarasa for music we have organized it into melodies and ragam and words we have vak which has Vak been the language Vak across everywhere that's yeah. idea and this has been the language of the veda as well from and then finally when we wanted to put it down for preservation we went into the symbols not only symbols also symbolism we'll see one very very beautiful example which is very relevant for today's uh, lecture and then the script akshara and notation now from all this what we find is that we have addressed the various layers in communication we have had a good handle because we approached it all the way from om which is pranava which is the subtle 
so from the subtle we moved to our written scripts and alphabets which is the gross and mind and matter so so we will to transcend both and which civilization can talk about mind than our civilization bharat which has been consistently documenting it for the last 5000 years only because today people talk about mindfulness and all that but we have been elaborating it for 5000 years oh. and we have had different mediums so based on the need we have chosen the mediums so certain things we have written on uh, cloth certain on manuscripts certain on stone so different aspects i mean we have just dabbled beautifully with uh, writing as well as that so now it will come to where is this phoenicia so like i like you I told you question. earlier it is the eastern mediterranean and uh, here uh, if you can't read from there you have places like tyre sidon biblos arvad ugrit and very close is damascus i'm reading some of the names out which are very very relevant to our biblos please hold that name in mind biblos from which comes a whole concept look at that word so, from that place the phoenician land the town biblos you get the word bible Be because it is the book so the book. if you look at the phoenician the book itself comes from biblos the word book itself the word the world traces alphabets to actually biblos in phoenicia so when they say phoenicia it also goes down to biblos the book the printing printing actually the the compilation of something called a book is traced to biblos and look at all the words that have therefore emanated which we today use in connection with book biblos bible bibliotheque for library geography and similarly damascus that we just saw now india used to send in all this entire path uh, one of the items that was traded was swords indian swords they and with watery designs these swords had watery designs and uh, watery wavy design is called damas the place that traded is called damascus and today we'll also find that there is jewelry called the damas in the um, dubai market it comes from this word damas because the, because the sword indian sword the oud steel ur oud is again a very european word because they couldn't say the word uruk or uk their tongue didn't roll out to say uruk so they call it oods that comes from the thing damas so damas is wavy steel that's what our steel was design was now in europe so we have seen go back go back go back explain this slide yeah so uh, in europe they wanted to understand uh, how the eastern economies how, how were the eastern asian and oriental countries we uh, how did they fare vis-a-vis -vis economies of the west and uh, they there is a millennial report of uh, angus madison which many people have been writing about a lot we have also been writing about it for the last 25 years plus since when the report came out where they speak see he personally is a xenophile Angus Madison, but even then he says one third of the world trade happened from India GDP for about thousand seven hundred years from the year one to seventeen hundred. No other country has held sway for seventeen hundred years of giving one third of the world GDP. Very sadly today, however, if you try to go and look for uh, these reports, you will find graphs like this where they have collapsed one to thousand. and therefore if you a single first glance you will look that india is continuously on the decline but this actually, what you see actually but it's not so actually it should, so. it should be like this from 1 to 1000 we have been steadily at 33% and then only due to various invasions we started our decline started much later but the point is what we should know is if you, you were 33% at 1 ce how could you have suddenly one day woken up and become 33% of world gdp you so, should have been trading consistently before that so millennia before that because you can't wake up one day morning and, and suddenly say i'm having one third of, of world gdp it must have been sort of built over millennia again for it sustained for millennia more so if you look at that for for many thousand years that is what led was the result of our traveling from tahiti to phoenicia and trading all over and, and leaving footprints everywhere all the footmarks everywhere now for this aspect of trade and commerce while we have communicated is one of the thing accounting is another aspect if you go back transportation overseas over land that was a key aspect for trade so we had mastered that and we had products to go with it so immediately if you ask we'll say what are the products that go with it 
Everybody will say, ah, oh, India gave spices. No, spices was the smallest of the products that we gave. Actually, it was the big five. When you talk about big five, you normally mean the big five game in Eastern Africa. But no, in India, the big five is very different. It is these products. So we had metal in the form of steel, zinc, copper and various alloys. Then cotton and silk, navigation, dyes, indigo and madder red besides various other. But these were the prominent ones. Then sugar, spice and diamonds as well. And all of these, I mean, because we had large ships and such large ships you don't need for spices. In fact, one interesting thing is we also exported ships. We built ships. Not only did we use ships to export other products, but we built and exported ships as well. And that's a beautiful story. We have written about all of this extensively in our book, Made in India. And the story on shipping and navigation is just just too deep. Amazing. How many of you heard of the Merchant of Venice by William Shakespeare? What were the merchants of Venice trading in to make that profit for the ships to go and come? What is the product? What is Venice built on? It's built in the ocean, but why? Where what is the product? Where did Shylock make his money? What? What is the product? Is it lending money is one. Uh, that why would they want money? To lend why money? lend money for what? What is the product? Name of the product. Indian sugar. 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 And spices is uh, Istanbul, Constantinople. Sugar is Venice. Is Indian sugar. And the city is, was built on sugar. And the bitter story behind the sweet product is today's world demography has been changed because of Indian sugar. Today's world demography is because of the influence of Indian sugar Sh and the world palate for so we'll sugar. So, a book called "While Sugar Is Sweet." The story of sugar is very bitter. That's the reality. We have written on that. You can check that later. So, the way we had a silk route. All of us talk about silk route, silk route. We had a metal route. See, silk route is 2000 years old at best. At best. But a metal route from India all the way from uh, Hanoi in East to Haifa in the West is 5000 years old. We never speak about it. That was our strength. The metal route of Bharat. And Bharat is right in the middle. So, that was the key thing. Okay. And now comes the interesting part. So, trade and commerce, look at the word we have for it. We have, okay, products, we have had our big five, transport, nav, the word nav, navigate, it uh, comes from our word nav, navai. And the uh, aspect of trade and commerce, we have called it vanijyam. Now, Why? what is vanijyam? Look at this word vanijyam. So, now we come back to the role of communication in this trade and in this prosperity. So, you can have your product, you can have your transportation, but if you cannot tell about your product, then how, how are you going to sell it? So, the, the, the aspect and who are the people who actually who traded? traded? Who are the, who went? And for that, I will actually okay. come before to this slide where the aspects of communication, we have had names for, and a divinity. We have had Saraswati who, who also denotes the reservoir, the medium of communication. Saras, Sarasche. Vidya for knowledge, vid, bark for words, vid, wit, wisdom, wit, vidya. Sharada for the lippi, veena for resonance and harmony, vani for eloquence. Ah, look at that, that's a key point for our discussion vani, this evening. Eloquence, bharti speech, shruti for sound, oral. Sound. oral. No, and no, no, that no, is no. how. Okay. Look at the word, why is it vani? And why is a trader, go back one slide, Akashwani finds, <laughs> no, no, why is a trader, here as she says, is called Vanigam, Vanijyam, what does that mean? He's, in speaking, you have to be sweet, your communication should be sweet, a way that person will accept you, that is important in communication, the idea of Vanijyam, Vanigam, that's where it comes from, Vani, explain that. So, this Vani... And who did that? We have our Indian merchants who have traded between Tahiti to Phoenicia, taking all these swords and the big five items. We have had a name. We saw a squirrel, right? We call them Shreni, which is the trade guilds. It's a Harappan term. Harappa Mojadara term. Shreni. And the Shreni comes from the root, which is Shrayam. Shra. And Shra is Shray, 
is to be noble to be reliable to be dependable that's why you get ashram shrayam and everything so where it's ashram. dependable reliable so our traders unlike the western concept where they caution you and tell you buyer beware because the trader will cheat you we have called our traders shreya shreshta because they've been noble they spoke the truth they were dependable their words were dependable the quality of goods was dependable and their trade was highly noble because it was sustaining the civilization here if you really go back and interview this with the social organization you will find these are the people who supported the civilization back home they would go trade bring the wealth and use it for upkeep of the civilization there are so many layers to this entire chain you can do chain. that later but this is all written in a book but the point look at this in europe it was buyer beware in india it is a trade is shreshta means shreshtan what do you call that means he is a noble person he will not cheat you he is dependable so indian civilization gave nobility to the tradesman the community the producer everything and they said that's why you have the idea of shubhlab we don't have profiteering idea because profits is good use it for self growing your business and growing your community so shubhlab idea and because the concepts it's diametrically opposite ideas concepts that are as far as trade is concerned here and that term Shreshta. all over the world all over india see the same term shreshta in tamil nadu it comes out to become shreshti siti seti shreshti seti chetti shetti chettiyar chetu seti siletar situ all over the land including sri lanka all the way up to assam look at the beauty of across the land right from harappan times you have a continuity and when i told this to some nagaratar chettiyars about this being noble do you know what they said you have given me a reason all of us have to be noble and good in our trade now because we have to live up to the name that the civilization has given us so that's what we look up to and this idea of communication is highly exemplified so what you see is you find that we have had various ways of communication we have excelled in communication we have brought in a science to the art of writing sounds everything but also uh, resorted to symbols and signs to convey a larger concept itself rather than speaking too many words and one of the best example is sri sukha brahma rishi and uh, shri r k swami was a devotee of this uh, sukha brahma rishi and uh, how do you find him you find him depicted like a a, a human with a parrot face so why? why a parrot face why is sukha brahma is, is he biologically a parrot no he But was why? the son of uh, veda vyasa shri veda vyasa krishna vaipayana shri veda vyasa who compiled recompiled rather the veda and sukha brahma rishi this was transmitted to sukha brahma rishi so that he could then take it to the world. rest of the world so now this brings us back so while we had lot of writing and other techniques the veda were actually always only orally transmitted and you needed somebody with the ability of a parrot to uh, listen it. to take in all that and then just repeat and bring it out again as is without distortion and sukha brahma rishi here stands not just for the idea of transmission but a transmission where no it was there was no distortion so actually veda vyasa he had uh, come up with a technique of transmission which is of called ashta vikriti wherein the veda what you hear today is the same as the veda that he had recompiled and all of this <laughs> is exemplified by this single image of a sukha brahma rishi with a parrot face so uh, this ties us back and ties in so many aspects of we are talking in mma where we are talking about management we are talking about commerce we are talking about trade but the foundation for all this besides the goods and the transportation and the other gross things that are needed are also the subtler aspects of communication and the thought uh, that has to go along with it and uh, this forms just one of the aspect of the many in our heritage and our pride just and, one aspect uh, like we always uh, say you know first you have to know what your heritage and heritage is then you have to own own it to stake claim to it 
you can't still have the world saying that phonetics and phonemes and phoenicia today i just uh, today morning i read one article where they have spoken about every country and its contribution india has no place in that uh, sure. i wanted to actually bring that quote and show yeah. the magnitude okay. sure. of uh, how we have just been bypassed by the world so we have to own it and then we have to expound it and in the case of advertising you have to flaunt it it's both has to happen okay so that's very so the first is to know that's what we are all doing now then own it then only you can expound about it and flaunt about it. that's when we'll get our, our rightful place in the committee of nations in the field of many other things all, all, along with knowledge you can do 3 million 3 trillion 4 trillion but still they say you have no roots but we are the strongest of the roots but we have to know what it is to own it that's what comes up and all of this lies in our name bharat the various aspects of our name bharat right from etymology from the advantage we get because of the location the fact about speech the fact that we enjoy sunshine and the weather all of these you can dovetail into the name bharat, bharat means a land of knowledge a land where people relish knowledge connoisseurs of knowledge we have 200 countries in the world you have six seven continents in the world do anybody call themselves as a land of knowledge people of knowledge only us we have been calling ourselves bharat for the last 5000 years meaning people who relish knowledge consistently no other country has called itself no other state city nagara gram nobody only we so consistently we have been land of knowledge land of knowledge land of knowledge. and if we don't know about it if you don't own it and say it repeatedly nobody will take you as a as a person of knowledge that's what we have to get back to so with that uh, small message uh, okay thank you we end this and are open to any questions anything that you have Okay. So one of the questions in the age of rapid technological advancement how can technology be leveraged to preserve and promote cultural heritage this is Sharmila from Coimbatore Okay. Oh, oh, good. So, actually, uh, we are at an advantage here again. Uh, there are many ways, and in fact, just yesterday's uh, Hindu also carried a beautiful article on Google Arts and Culture, uh, how technology is uh, being used to showcase all of this. But see, here again, there are there are layers. Technology for showcasing is one thing. Using technology to lay claim. to this heritage is the next aspect and third is using technology to further our own knowledge by looking at relevant applications today for today is the third aspect so technology has a role to play in all the three to from showcasing to identifying what's relevant you know we normally uh, talk about the five a's first is to be aware second is to appreciate third is to uh, absorb appreciate only if you are appreciating you will open up your gate to absorb and imbibe it that is when you can then start working on adaptations and only when you start adapting then will you find applications so we talk about the 5a circle when we talk about this knowledge of the civilization from the past and all of these steps technology has a good role to play Yeah, here somebody who said Kartik who said about Kuom is our pride. Yes, certainly, but unfortunately we have abused it. Kuom is certainly our pride. There's no doubt about it. What can we do to make it beautiful? Yes, certainly we can do. See the the point is, see see the two blows that or the water bodies of this land have received in 1857, momentous year when India lost. one of it wars of independence because we had many wars before that too this on the first world war we had many before that what did the british do they said okay you are attacking us we we'll, let's break your backbone what is your backbone your water bodies your 6 lakh water bodies is your backbone 6 lakh water bodies starting from the zing in ladakh all the way up to anekat in kanyakumari these are your, your heritage 
six lakh water bottles. What did they show? They started something called the PWD department, Public Works Department, and took over all the water bodies into the department. So what was owned and operated, owned by the women of the land and operated upon, maintained for the prosperity purpose, they took over by that. So we lost our water bodies legally. To, to, uh, to a department called the Public Works Department and they are sitting there, don't know what is happening in the villages or, or anywhere. They don't have a list of the what's happening. So that's the unfortunate thing. 100 years later, what did we do? In the name of secularization, we de-divinized our water bodies. Before the, all our water bodies were divine. So there are two laws. One in 1857 and the second 100 years later, in 1950s, we again de-divinized all our water bodies. Naturally, it led to uh, uncontrolled pollution of right from Ganga uh, becoming, becoming Miley to all the water bodies all over the land. So we will have to recognize this. We have had a twin blow, legal blows both and go to proper recourse and rec for this we have to know first. Only if we know that these are the two problems. Cleaning a local water body, yes, must be done by the local people. Has to be done. Uh, ensuring that there is no garbage going to water bodies is, is must be done. But there is a larger national idea, national discourse that must be understood. What it is. So remove the twin blows. Overcome them again. So that we can recover them back for the next century for our great-grandchildren. Not just our children or grandchildren, but even for our great-grandchildren. That's a duty that we have. That is inheritance. What is sustainability? Taking something which is good and giving to the next generation even better. That's sustainable. And uh, there are a few questions which are all very similar and uh, which to which we have almost answered in our uh, the first question. How are we going to tell those heritage stories to future generations? What challenges do you see in preserving and promoting our cultural heritage in the modern world? Are there any digital initiatives or tools that you find promising for the documentation and dissemination of heritage information? So like I said, today we are finding a lot of tools uh, both for presenting it online, also for experiencing things digitally like VR, AR and so on. But, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, when we started Bharat Gyan, like we said, uh, you know, we saw people showcasing their civilization and we said we want to showcase our civilization. And we started Bharat Gyan with the tagline, we still have the tagline, experience the knowledge of India. Because we said we want people to experience this knowledge because nobody is reading books. Let's make it an experience. But then what we are also realizing is there, that there is really no Indian narrative. There is no Indic narrative about our own civilization. So we have to create that authentic narrative as well. And which is where we got uh, into the act of documenting all this. Because we said, okay, somebody will come and they can create the experiences. But let us start when the tap is open. Let us collect all this data and at least document it for posterity. So that's what we've been doing. So you cannot do away with just uh, writing documentation as well. You need that. And so we made films. We, till date, we made about 718 film short films because people watch films only for for at best 150, 180, 200 seconds. So we made about 700 films like that for people to watch, which are quite popular. Many and, people watch that. So that is there. And if you say she said. There was this, what is the challenge you are seeing in uh, taking this to people? And I would like to dovetail it with the next question here. How can education play a role in instilling a sense of pride and appreciation for one's cultural heritage? Do you think it should be included at school and college level education, the Sabrish? Now, uh, Sabrish, thank you for asking this question because this has been the challenge that we found. You know, we have conducted courses. We have offered them for free. We have spoken to so many people, but yet, you know, the acceptance is just, okay, quite interest, that's all. So unless you have a whip, people will not be willing to really study or take to these, uh, in, take to this information. And that's where we find that the new NEP, where they have brought in Indian knowledge system at the school level and also for college, uh, is a very good initiative and hopefully this will pave the way for this knowledge to get into the system in the coming because decade everybody then will be uh, will have to at least go through a few courses and somewhere from awareness it will change to appreciation and then absorption and then pave the way so uh, we are really hopeful with this uh, initiative let me put a question to you people you know 
in a continuum there are five big uh, products coming we have talked about communication talked about uh, uh, exports all of that but there is a navigation stuff there which you never caught, talked about there is you just talk about na we navigation given to the world maybe you can tell us more about how india has been a amazing country when it comes to navigation see the word uh, thank you for a very nice question very important question the, look at the idea of the word navy navigate comes from the indian word navai navgat navai in tamil navgat nav for boat so this is a so such an ancient idea that we have, we have not as you said phonetics phonemes we have been not only given ships we have also given the, the very name for it now all of us know about the uh, like indian national anthem what is the national anthem of usa the stars and stripes right star spangled banner where was it written in the boston harbor on what it was written on an indian made ship so indian made ships had traveled to europe and from there across the atlantic to east coast of americas and similar to the west coast and that was the so we were not only transporting our goods we were making selling ships and look at the oak wood ships had life of 40 years 30 years 40 years, because oak wood that's all it has in marine aquatic life whereas the teak wood ships of india made in india had a 100 plus years life and they were 10 times the size of those ships so actually if you see uh, navigation we have Uh, we have been excelling in navigation from more than 5000 years you will see records of the greek talking about the iron that is coming from india for their battles the arrow heads in their battles so we sometimes we just jokingly we say the arms dealer of the yester years was actually india because all the swords and uh, iron arrow heads everything was going salt peter in the uh, after the british the colonialists the colonists why did they come here i mean they found lot of salt peter so, for uh, for well, fireworks and ammunition so we have actually spurred the arms race in the world in one way but uh, there are uh, i would look at navigation in two uh, halves one is the navigation that we used for our trade and we built our prosperity and we have a saying called krinvanto vishwam aryam where we yeah. sailed the world over to make it a noble place aryam nobility nobility and we did it with trade there is a second part where the when the colonials came and they saw this navigational power they and the skills they exploited it for their own needs so they got us the ship trade I mean, where they built ships for them and they took these ships and colonized world over we have a beautiful uh, listing of how britain could not have colonized the world if it was if it was not, not for the indian for ships, the indian, the ships indian, indian sailors indian shipwrights so and the indian shipping skills. metallurgy indian metals because you when you go on ships you you need all the uh, all the metal works so without that britain could not have colonized whole of europe could not have colonized could not have taken place a fundamental thing happened so that was a game changer for the world but unfortunately we lost our uh, navigational uh, prowess prowess it was suppressed during colonial times very uh, wisely uh, you know uh, uh, wisely for the europeans so uh, strategically and now of course we are on the rise and uh, it's only with navigation that we'll come back we've got such a vast coastline that is the strength that we have to play on i hope i have answered part of your question okay there is how they escorted vasco da gama to can india can i just take 2 yeah. minutes you want me to show the film we have a film on it no because i don't know you got time can i take 2 minutes yeah so so she'll show you a film just a two it's just a 120 second film see when vasco da gama came so okay we have south africa what's the southern tip of south africa called cape of good hope what is good hope about it what why is it, why is that cape called good hope hari just one second she doesn't want me to break the secret she show it to you there okay think think of those because while we had a naval area which i actually has a slide for 
uh, that shows from all over the Bay of Bengal to the Arabian Sea to the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, which we call Santi Sagar, we had to go to Tahiti. Whereas the whole of the, uh, what do you call the, uh, look at this, the ship sizes, the largest two ships the world had was Santa Maria and Santa Gabriel, Sao Gabriel. So those were, whereas Indian ships were 10 times its size. See, we normally, we, we realized this when we were at Istanbul and, uh, you know, at this particular point, many, in about 1300s, when the Turks took over Constantinople and it became Istanbul, that's when our Talavidi was written. Because until then, all the products that we saw were going Look at this, from like the here. The fate of India changed in the Bosphorus Strait of Turkey in Istanbul. All the products used to go through this route and the, this was a Byzantine empire then and uh, which was favorable to the west. So it would pass from here and reach Europe. But the moment the Turks took over this particular uh, point and made it Istanbul, they cut off the trade route to the west from the east. So all these countries were starving for these goods. They now wanted to find a route and they started traveling. Till then they never came to India, it was the Arabs who would take it along. So they started travelling to India. We had people in 1482, Diogo Chao, he could not find. Then you had Bartolomo Diaz and he tried to come down the coast of Africa and to go to uh, India. And when his ship reached the southern tip of Africa, it his sank. ship sank. In fact, Bartolomo maps, he was the one who charted these seas. That's why maps are called Bartolomo maps. And his ship sank here. So any ship that could go beyond this Cross, point crossover. towards India had hope. Good hope. So that is why this point came to be called Good Hope. So India decided the Good Hope for a cape, for a place in South Africa. So then we had the impact we had. Then in the 1490s is when, uh, when they discovered that the world is round, that Christopher Columbus said he will sail westwards to find India. He so, said, second navigate the globe and reach India. He takes the biggest ship, he gets a biggest ship built and he goes around. Till then, world ended at Canary Islands for them. They didn't know of anything else. So, as he sailed, the first landmass he encounters, he thinks that is India. And that is how he was born the West Indies. Mind you, he didn't go to America yet. He landed only near West he Indies. He never went to the mainland. He only and went to West Indies. West Indies and the people there, he thought were Indians and they came to be called Red Indians. So, India centric. His follower, Amerigo Vespucci, who actually ventured further into the main uh, American land. So that is how he tried. Then came Vasco da Gama in 97. He takes the largest ship from Portugal of his times and he comes down the same path that Bartolomeu had mapped. He comes up to Cape of Good Hope and in his own writings, in his diary in Lisbon, he writes, that when he comes here, he finds, he is also perplexed how to go because the, ma, ma, ba, Bartholomew did not leave any notes. He finds Indian ships that are 10 times the size of his ship. And amidst these Indian ships, he is navigated, he is escorted. He is even escorted by the Indian shipwrights to come and they come by Mozambique and they come to the port of Kohikod, Calicut. And there whom do they encounter? They encounter Samutti Rai. Samudra Rai, king, king of the seas. And what, what does he become? It, it now today we know him as Zamorin because of the Portugal uh, so tongue Portugal and the influence. Portugal couldn't say Samutra Rai. It's actually Samutra Rai because the king of the seas. We call it Zamorin. Even today they call Zamorin, unfortunately. See? So look at how all we have influenced the world. India, you find it in East Indies, you find it in West Indies, you find it in Red Indians, you find it in Indonesia. And even Cape of Good Hope, while it may not carry the name India, it carries the sentiment of India. So Cape of Good Hope has also been influenced by India. So it is India that has ruled the world. So when you see that 33% GDP, it is, uh, I mean, uh, perhaps it's an understatement also. And they were all searching for the most prosperous country. It was like a uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And this is substantiated by ship sizes of uh, from Indian texts which show Nav the Shastra. names of uh, various Indian ships and how they were actually uh, this Look is Santa Maria of, of uh, Christopher Columbus, Sao Gabriel of Vasco da Gama and look at Gamini, Tari, 
Jangala, Plavini, the one that could plow through the waters. Dharini, look at it, it's also... It bears. The bears weight, weight. something that can be Heavy transporting. Begini, one of our fast ships. Fast the ships, Begini. The names that we had given them. And uh, so there are a lot of... Uh, Mm. Proofs otherwise, uh, which talk yeah, about the uh, navigational prowess. Uh, we have written about all this in great detail, uh, especially while these are very ancient, even as recent as 1700s, 1800s, what was the state of Indian navigation, the harbors, the kind of ports, and you know who built these uh, ships? In fact, even Al Alexander. Nearchus, who had come with Alexander in 326 BC, when they returned, uh, mind you, we always say Alexander met his defeat at the hands of Porus and then they oh, were sure. returning. And when they were returning, they needed ships to return. All his uh, uh, armies were already tired. And these ships were built by Indian Finish. shipwrights. Thank you. So, I, I think that's enough. Uh, he said, thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're well past our uh, allotted time. Uh, all this content is available in our website, bharatgyan.com, and our 100 plus books, 700 films, 700 articles. Please read them. They're all available for all of you. Thank you so much once again to Mr. Srinivasik Swami. Thank you, and, sir. Uh, we have gone. There's so much of knowledge. Uh, uh, because a lot of people are watching out live, so we want to keep the time management. May I request uh, Mali uh, and Shankar to step forward and do the honor. What we are presenting you is... Uh, the thing which is painted by our children. We do a lot of CSR work in the school, supported by Access System and the AS Trust and so proud of which. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.